It's 4.30, good afternoon and welcome to LJ News. Two years ago, Lai Chuan traded the bustling metropolis of Beijing for the tranquility of an ancient monastery in central China. At the age of 32, the daily grind of working as an editor at a high-profile publishing house had taken its toll. It wasn't about the pace being fast or slow, but rather I felt it was meaningless, Lai says. So, he quit his job and made the pilgrimage to Wat Dang Mountain in Hubei province, renowned for its practice of Taoism and Tai Chi. Lai didn't go back to an office job. Today, he runs a small convenience store out of his grandparents' vacant home in the Hatongs, the narrow alleyways of old Beijing. It's a working class neighborhood like the one he grew up in. I wanted to rediscover my roots. So I went back to my starting point in the Hatongs, he says. Lai Chuang is among a growing number of young professionals in China rejecting the traditional narrative of success in favor of a minimalist lifestyle. Instead of working hard, buying a house, getting married and having children, some young Chinese are opting out of the rat race and taking up low paying jobs or not working at all. This simple act of resistance is commonly known as tanking or lying flat. These days, Lai often practices Tai Chi in the mornings and, when business is quiet in the evenings, he plays his guitar or Gikwin. At almost 190 centimeters tall, he appears like a giant in his 15 square meter shop stacked with everything from chips to toilet paper. The lying flat movement emerged in April after a blog post by factory worker Luo Hazong entitled Lying Flat is Justice. Burnt down from overworking, the 31 year old quit and cycled more than 2,000 kilometers from Sichuan province to Tibet, working odd jobs along the way. After working for so long, I just felt numb like a machine, he told the New York Times in an interview, and so I resigned. His change of lifestyle became a source of inspiration for others. His posts were celebrated as a manifesto against materialism. Lying flat resonated with students overwhelmed by the pressure to complete with millions of others each year for a place at a top university and then again for well-paid jobs once they get trained. It spoke to a generation of urban workers enchanted by the notorious 996 work culture where staff are expected to work from 9am to 9pm six days a week. So it was little surprise that some young Chinese started turning their backs on work and consumption as a common goal. For Chinese officials, it is the exact opposite of what the nation has asked of its people. The government wants a young generation of patriotic and productive workers. For the majority, there is no differentiation of lowliness or nobleness of one's job, said President Xi Jinping in a video clip that has circulated widely on social media in and outside of China. As long as you're needed by society, as long as you're respected and earn a decent pay, that is a good job. More than anything, China is counting on continuing economic development, particularly as it grapples with an aging population. The Communist Party has labeled Tangping a threat to the stability. The state media calls it shameful. An online discussion of the movement is censored. We're living in a society that won't allow you to quit. Maybe in other countries, people are allowed to dream of becoming a barber, like Chuang Pontus. Lai admits most of his friends and family, including his father, don't share his enthusiasm for his new lifestyle. There are people telling me, you should feel sorry for laying your parents down and wasting the resources of our country. You got a master's degree with their support, but you end up running a corner store? He says. It's like I should say sorry to the whole country. Many of them dismiss his work choice as merely an attempt to escape. For generations, public servants were guaranteed lifetime employment and a pension under the so-called unrest bowl. 
Mao Zedong believed it was the duty of the communist state to provide everyone with a job. The government assigned citizens a job for life with guaranteed wages. Schooling, housing and health care were included, dispensed by a workers' done way at war work unit. But when Deng Xiaoping began in 1978 to transform China from a centrally planned economy to a more free market economy, his supporters insisted that the Iron Rights Bowl had to be smashed if China was to modernize. It's the great paradox many young Chinese now contend with. Like their parents, they're expected to show loyalty to the state, but without the state benefits that their parents once enjoyed. They face both the pressure to compete in a market economy and the pressure to conform in an authoritarian society. According to Lai, in today's China, happiness is no longer handed out by the government but is meant to be found in material success. Everyone is given their quota of happiness, he says. If you get your quota, you have happiness. But is this happiness the real happiness for you?